they are there to be the most protected place that we can make it on the ship. This is looking down. We're going to be standing right around engine number one here in the forward engine room. Engines, there's four engines, two in each engine room. And these engine rooms are virtually totally independent of each other. So that if, for instance, the one we're going to be in gets wiped out, flooded, wrecked in some way, the aft engine room still can make enough turns to get us out of harm's way. The previous Hornet, the engineering spaces were somewhat interconnected. And they were damaged. They couldn't make steam. They couldn't turn the propellers. They, we tried to tow her. We couldn't, and she was lost. It had to be sunk. So in some ways, this is a way of trying to get around that by separating the engines into two completely separate and independent spaces. Now, when we're standing there talking on the sides of the, we'll call it a wall or a bulkhead, the water's not lapping right up against where we are. There is another 20 feet of voids all <coughs> the ship. They're four feet wide and there's five of them, so they go out 20 feet. So, for instance, we're going to be standing in here and there's still 20 feet before the water. And then there's a, an armored band around. So, say a torpedo would have to go through the armored band and then it would have to go through these voids that are holding uh, fuel, salt water, or fresh water, whatever. And they're like accordions to take up the shock. So everything in same underneath. And then the armor plate on top. We're doing everything we can to make this the safest place on the ship. Not safe necessarily from people, but safe and make it, how can I say it this way? We want to be able to make steam to turn the propellers. If we can't do that, this ship is dead. So we've got to get it as best we can, protected from the bad guys. Okay, we're going to go down two more ladders. The second ladder down is fairly long. Again, turn around and back down. If that's four engines, two in this engine room, two in the back engine room or the aft engine room. Each one of these, one here and there's one over behind us, so the two here. Uh, this one happens to be named Shirley, as you can see. It was the only one of the four that still had a name on it from when we got the ship and started address, you know, restoring the area. No idea who Shirley is, wife, mother, sister, we have no idea. But, she was here, so we kept her name. Each one of these engines generates 37,500 horsepower. So a total of 150,000 horsepower can push the fully loaded Hornet at 33 knots, about 38 miles an hour. Now, when you do that, your fuel gauge goes like this. So you don't want to do it very often. But you could water ski barefoot behind her. She's moving right along. Oh, she's not a piston engine, she's not like your car, there's no pistons going up and down. This is a steam turbine, so it's like a jet engine, it's full of rotor blades. And what drives those blades is steam. And what we do to make the steam, there's two boilers attached to each engine, so a total of eight boilers. And they take this black, gunky, awful stuff right out of the ground called bunker sea oil. And that's what is used to burn, just like on your stove, to boil water to make steam. So we have fresh water, we have air, and we have this burning oil, and we make steam. As soon as the steam is made, it's taken over and superheated so that we get as much energy into it as we can. So it comes over here at 600 PSI. Think of your car tires, 30 PSI. This is 600 PSI and about 800 degrees. That steam comes over here, and there's a part of Shirley you can't quite see over behind her. It's called the high pressure turbine. That 600 pound steam goes into that high pressure turbine and turns a shaft at something that could easily be 4,000 RPM. The exhaust steam coming out of there now has done its job. It's greatly reduced. It's kind of almost like the exhaust again coming out of your car. But instead of losing that, we bring it over and we put it, see right above Shirley's name, it says LP, low pressure. That exhaust steam comes down to the middle of Shirley, and the way she's built, it drives this turbine at about the same 4,000 RPM. Not quite, but close enough. So you've got two shafts spinning at 4,000 RPM way, way too fast for the propeller shaft and that big old 15-foot propeller out there. 
the maximum they can spin is about 280 RPM, give or take. So that big gray box back there, that's the reduction gearbox. That takes those two shafts and gears it all down, and out the back end of that comes the actual propeller shaft spinning, uh, in this example, 250 RPM, something like that. Now these are big, big pieces of equipment. This is like opening your car hood, just looking at the very top of the motor. She goes down two levels. That reduction gearbox goes down two levels. There's another level below us, identical almost to this one, and there'd be as many guys working down there as would be working up here. And then there's another area down below that. So these are big, big things, and not to be taken lightly. They're pretty serious pieces of equipment. One other thing the steam does when it comes over here, it makes electricity. And that's what y'all are leaning on right there. That's a steam-driven electrical generator. There's four of those on the ship. And that's where we make the electricity to power the lights, the pumps, whatever we need electricity for. That's where we get it. Now, it's not going to take long to run out of fresh water to make steam. So we have to be able to make our own fresh water. And a whole part of this engineering facility is called the evaporators. And they're a couple hundred feet off in that direction somewhere. A room full of great big pieces of equipment that a bunch of weird people work in. And they can make about 100,000 gallons a day of fresh water by taking seawater and blowing steam through it and in effect almost instantly turning that seawater into steam. And then they condense it down to fresh water. And like I said, about 100,000 gallons a day. And under normal conditions, about half of that would go to the crew for food prep, sanitary, whatever you need. The other half would come over here to the engineering facility. Now, if we wanted to back up, very simple. That 600-pound steam going over here to the high-pressure turbine, we simply turn a big wheel in here, I'll show you that, and cut off that steam. It can't go there. So there's no steam turning that turbine, so it doesn't spin. There's no steam coming over here to Shirley because that's the exhaust steam. So we divert that 500 pound or 600 pound steam to each end of Shirley, a stern steam. The two rows of blades at each end are put in backwards. So when that 600 pound steam hits them, it turns the shaft backwards. And that's how we back up. We just divert the steam, no problem. Nothing done in this room has anything to do with steering. Of course, that's the big rudder, and that's the helm up in the pilot house. If there was a serious emergency and that was all knocked out, we could sort of kind of steer it by some engines going faster than others and, you know, counter doing some unbalancing kinds of things. Um, but normally that's not the case. This is simply forwards and backwards, fast and slow. We don't do anything about steering down here. Uh, once the steam goes down through Shirley, again using your car example, there's a great big radiator down under, a great big box full of seawater, full of tubes with sea nice cold seawater in them. That steam passes between those tubes, condenses back into fresh water, taken over, cleaned up, processed a little bit, back to the boilers, used over again. Trouble is we lose a lot along the way. This is almost like a rainforest down here. These various uh, Gates and valves and everything are wet valves. They're supposed to leak, and they do. So there's a lot of water dripping down, running around, a lot of condensation going on. Average temperature down here working is 120 degrees. That's on average. And you're down here for four hours. You're off for eight. You're on for four. You're off for eight. 120 degrees. And the noise. Back in the Hornet's day, nobody thought anything about hearing protection. Who, who knew? You just came down here and worked. Average noise levels when they started checking them were over 90 decibel. Friends that worked in engineering on these ships are deaf, or at least wearing a couple hearing aids and hoping they can hear you. Uh, under normal conditions, I'm told, you couldn't talk to anybody down here. You'd, you'd just see my lips moving. I'd have to come over and scream in your ear to communicate. A lot of hand signals, a lot of stuff going on like that, but no, no casual conversations. The noise level is at a constant source of bad. 
Okay, this is the main control panel. Let's squeeze in over here a little bit for a couple of minutes and best you can. This young man can get up front here. That's okay. We good? Yep. Okay, this is the main control panel. And the reason it's the main one, well, from here over, pretty much all four engines have this same array of gauges, valves. These are the throttles to open and close the amount of steam going into the engines. This same array, there's four of these stations, one for each engine. From here over, this is only here in this one place. It's not at the other engines. And you'll notice everything here is in eights, and that's because this is everything to do with the boilers. And the fellow standing here with his aides and his talkers behind him, he is the engineering officer of the watch. What that means is he's the boss of the entire system for the four hours he's here. The engines, the boilers, the electrical generators, the evaporators, you name it, he's the guy in charge. And if something goes terribly wrong, he's the guy that gets thrown under the bus. He's usually a lieutenant in the Navy, which is like a captain in the Army or the Marine Corps. He's been training at this for a couple of years, and he's in charge. All of this information is about the boilers. So it's everything he needs to know about how the boilers are operating. And he can look over here, and he can see what Shirley's doing, and he can see what the other three engines are doing all without ever leaving, standing right where you are. Now, this is the throttleman. This is the guy with his foot actually on the gas pedal. If we want to go faster, we put more steam into Shirley. If we want to slow down, we take steam away from her. If we want to back up, we take all the steam away from her, and we open the stern steam to move that steam over to the edges of her. So this is the guy that does that on command. He doesn't just do it because he wants to. Now everything down here is in RPM. We don't ever think down here in terms of knots or miles per hour or anything like that. We may get a command from the bridge, make turns for 20 knots. Well we know that's, and pick a numbers out of the air here, we know that's 200 RPM. So if we get a command like that, we simply start reacting and we get Shirley going 200 RPM the other three engines, 200 RPM, and that's given the captain his 20 knots. Everybody's happy. Now up in the pilot house, you've got the steering wheel. That's the helm, 1943. That's the original steering wheel from the Hornet. And right next to it is the engine order telegraph. I'm sure you've seen movies. They move those handles, the bell rings. Every one of these divisions is five knots, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 knots. So let's say we're cruising along at all ahead two-thirds, that's 10 knots. Down here, that's 100 RPM. Everything is finely tuned. The boilers are giving me all the energy I need. The guys over in the boilers, they're playing gin rummy. Everybody's happy. All of a sudden, this bell rings, but loud enough to wake the dead because of the noise down here. And I look over, and I see that where it said all ahead two-thirds, now this has moved, let's say, to all ahead full. So what's happened up on the bridge, somebody's given the order, change the speed all ahead full. So who's ever doing that moves those handles. One handle, notify, rings the bell for the port engines, one for the starboard engines. So all four engines, there's a bell ringing. They get the word, we're changing speed. And you look over here, and they move that lever from two-thirds to all ahead, whatever I said, uh, full. So we're going to go from up there from 10 knots to 20. What that means down here is we're going to go from 100 to 200 as fast as we can. The boilers have gotten the word starting to get frantic now because we got to get way more energy over here. I got to get Shirley really cranking on. But what I do, I come over here and it's broken unfortunately, but I turn mine from two, all ahead two thirds to full. And when I put my lever on full, it rings a bell on the bridge. They know, I know, because I've answered the bell. 
So now everybody's cool. We know what we need to do. Here comes the boilers. They're putting in more oil. They're burning. There's more fresh water, more air, everything getting me more energy as quick as they can. And I'm watching this main steam gauge rise. As, as it's going up, I'm opening up Shirley. And she's going from 100. She's creeping up to 200. They're doing the same thing at their engines. If I get a little overexcited here and I open her up too quickly, and it drops below that red line, now there's not enough steam coming over here to also make electricity. So I just turn the lights off. Or at least I flicker the lights. The captain gets very excited about that. So the officer of the watch is going to come over here and whisper in my ear, slow down, you know, take it easy, back off. So we're keeping an eye. There's all sorts of things going on. <coughs> Once we get up around 200, we settle in. They do the same thing. Everybody's happy. The boiler guys catch their breath. And now we just cruise along like that until somebody changes the speed, either slower or a little bit faster maybe. But usually you will slow down at some point. Um. One other thing. You're standing right here. Good. Right here there is a wind speed and wind direction gauge. We're 10 <coughs> floors or stories or levels below the flight deck. <laughs> Why do we care what the wind speed is on the flight deck? Who cares? Down there, no wind down here. Well, we might get, or we would get, probably every day, word down here that the captain is planning to on this tour at 1500, so call it 1600, 4 o'clock. Prepare to launch aircraft 1600 hours. Well, Shirley's going something, say, 15 knots, 150 RPM. We're cruising along. And we know, and again, I'm making up a number here, but to launch an airplane, what's called deck launch, meaning you're not using the catapults, the plane is rolling down the deck and taking off. To launch an aircraft like that, you need 55 knots of wind, whatever. Well, we look over here, and we see Mother Nature's only given us 30. But where are we going to get the other 25 to make 55? Poor old Shirley and her friends. So pretty soon those boilers are going nuts and we're opening Shirley all the way up to get 25 knots of speed into the ship, into the wind. The wind coming down, 55 knots, the planes can fly. So it's very important that we know what's going on so we can plan ahead. We have 20 minutes, a half hour, whatever it might be to get up to speed. The other thing, this black, ugly, gunky bunker oil that we're burning, highly acidic, and it's crudding up the boiler tubes like crazy, really ugly stuff. So every day we need to blow the tubes. We need to send steam up there and strip all that garbage out of there and off into the atmosphere. Well, if the wind is blowing down the deck, that's going to lay all that acidic garbage on all our airplanes. Not a good idea. So we've got to wait till the wind is, we see it going across the deck. And by the way, we know which direction we're going because there's a compass right above this gentleman's head. And so we, we always know where we're headed kind of thing. And the captain will play into that. He might say, uh, you know, don't do it because we need to continue this course and the wind is wrong and all. But everybody knows we've got to blow the tubes. And the minute we can, we do to get that garbage going over into the water and not down the deck. So a couple of critical pieces of information here just to have in our pocket when we need it. Uh, that kind of in a nutshell is how it all works down here. There would be half a dozen people here on this level in this engine room in total probably 30 people, another 30 down below us, same in the aft engine room. And you got the boilers and the evaporators. The engineering department on a ship like this was about 600 people. So it was the biggest department on the ship. Because you're on four hours, you're off eight. Now in terms of that heat I was talking about the noise, there was no air conditioning. The big nuclear carriers and the big newer ships today, this area is all enclosed. It's soundproofed as best they can make it. It's air conditioned and it's livable. Uh, this is it in the Hornet's day. And you might notice up here these big springs, because not only is 600 pounds steam coming over here, 
It is screaming, and these pipes are jumping up and down. This place is alive, and it's just a, a pretty incredible working environment. And the only air we get, this big, big opening again, right here, right under, yeah, <laughs> watch your deck. That's coming from up on the bridge. A big blower like that one I turned on is sending air down in parts of the ship, coming out of here. And here I stand for four hours. Now, if we're off uh, Alaska at Christmas time, that's pretty refreshing. I might even have this jacket on. But we're off Vietnam in the summertime in the South China Sea, where the temperature is 90 degrees, 90% 90 humidity, and that's blowing in my face for four hours. Not fun. So um, you just learn to live with it. One last thing, uh, you all have cell phones in your pocket probably, and I'm sure you've heard many times that that's got more power than all of the computers used to launch uh, the Man to the Moon and back again. Uh, and when those guys got back from the moon, this was the state-of-the-art ship. This was ready to receive them. And here's our computer down here, right here. This gorgeous computer, this is it, 1969. This is, this is the iPad of the day. As things are happening here, there's a talker here, and he's, oh, this valve is closed. This valve is open. This doesn't do anything, but it's an indication board, an indicator. So now my four hours are up. This guy, everybody here is melted. So they're just, they want to get out of here. Here comes the new officer of the watch coming down here. And he stands here with his coffee cup, and he sees what's been done since he was here the last time. So he has an up-to-the-minute view of the whole system. You can see main steam system, auxiliary, auxiliary exhaust. This tells him everything he needs to know. They never talk. They really can't very well, so they never do. They just pass each other and off they go. State of the art. Okay, wander around for a couple minutes. Keep your children with you, please. And uh, the Electrical panel back behind the engineer or the electrical generator. It's got a bunch of gauges on it and some uh, yellow and red lights lit. That's shore power. That's 440 volts. It's hot. It's active. Stay away from it, please. You're going to be a piece of toast. <laughs> ice cream and other assorted sweets. If your tax dollar pays the crew to get three square meals a day, and that's what they make in the big kitchens. There's eight kitchens on board, and so they feed you three squares a day. If you, for some reason, are getting out of the engine room at three in the morning, you're hot, dirty, tired, all you want to do is get a Coke or an ice cream cone or 
God forbid, a spam sandwich or something, you come here to get it. This is kind of like an early McDonald's, if you will. Now, there's some argument back and forth between the old crews. Some paid for this, others didn't. So as we ask people, they say, yeah, we had to pay a nickel or a dime. Others say, no, we just come here and get whatever we wanted. We don't know for sure how that worked. Um, this was a capital, well, a couple things about this space. This, this ship, I may have mentioned to some of you already, was the largest ship we had in World War II. Physically, it was the biggest. There were 24 of these made. Uh, battleships weighed more because of their armor, but this was the biggest ship with the biggest crew, 3,200 people, including the air crews. So a lot of people on board. And because it was a big ship, it was usually always the center of a fleet of ships. And as the center of a fleet, it had an admiral on board who was running all of the other ships, including this one. He and his staff were embarked on the Hornet or whatever other ship. And when there was an admiral on board, you literally fly this flag up on the mast. Therefore, you're a flagship. And that's where the term comes from. So the Hornet was always a flagship. Now, therein lies the tale. Between these two doors, this was the only place on the Hornet where rank had no privilege. Little lowly third class Seaman Johnson coming out of the engine room all at once at Coke. I'm going to go take a shower. It's two or three in the morning. Eight or ten people back as a two star admiral. Never, ever would he cut him off. He waits his turn. I run into him out there or out there, God help me. But in here, not. And the other thing about this room is ice cream. A ship this size, because of its physical size, had huge machines that made a lot of ice cream and huge frozen rooms to store it in. And when you tell a crew that tonight 3,200 dinners are going to be served, and oh, by the way, we have ice cream for dessert, you better have 3,200 scoops of ice cream or 6,400. A lot of ice cream and this ship could make it. The smaller ships couldn't because they physically didn't have the room for the equipment. So destroyers, frigates, no ice cream. Hornet is sailing through the water, launching and recovering airplanes. One of those planes, now and then, goes in the water. Engine failure, pilot error, whatever. Bang, in the water. There sits the pilot getting his feet wet, looking very forlorn. The Hornet can't turn around and come back. It's got to continue to do its mission. Sails over the horizon. Well, behind the Hornet are one or two little tiny ships like frigates. And their job that day is to plane guard. When a plane goes in the water, they race up and get the pilot. Then they speed up and go catch the Hornet, transfer the pilot back on board the Hornet. Well, you don't do that for free. There's a ransom, and it is ice cream. And it has always been ice cream in the American Navy. To this day, it's ice cream. So, Ensign Jones here, lowly, lowest ranking officer, Ensign pilot, 25 gallons, maybe, throw in an old Roy Rogers movie, something else tonight, you know. But, so at least my crew has ice cream for tonight. However, Mr. Michigan here, Commander Michigan, the head of the whole air wing, he's up there flying around, has engine failure, bang in the water. I pick him up. I have died and gone to heaven. Because he's a commander, he's head of the air wing, he's worth 100 gallons of ice cream to start. And we'll negotiate from there. My crew has got ice cream for a week. We don't even know where to store it all. Thank you very much. <laughs> so ice cream is the ransom. Now, a few months back, we had a couple of active duty uh, Australian Navy guys were in town for something, and they came aboard, told them about ice cream ransom. They just rolled their eyes and said some very unpleasant things about the American Navy. Their ransom is Foster's beer. <laughs> always has been, always will be. They can drink alcohol on their ships. We can't. We do, but we can't. <laughs> and I'm told in World War II, a ship like this, every nook and cranny corner had a still or a stash of liquor of some kind, homemade or otherwise. And if you got caught, you spent a little time in jail or in the brig, but it was everywhere. And pilots, of course, God love them, you know, they leave the ship not knowing they're going to come back or not. 
So they were kind of allowed, wink, wink, nod, nod. They all had trunkfuls of egg and egg or whatever was their favorite medicinal beverage. And nobody paid any attention to them because of what they were doing. So, But for me and you, the lowly ensign, you know, we better not be caught with anything. <laughs> Even though the captain was a heavy egg and egg man himself. So. Okay, let's keep on moving down this direction, please. place for a marine guard post. You know, understand that when we're the ships of active duty, there's no visitors like us around. It's only the crew. So here we are. What are they guarding? What? Torpedoes? Nah, not quite. Almost. Bombs. Bombs. Yep, that's there. Well, Bombs rather not torpedoes. two levels below us are where the nuclear weapons were kept. And you can go through that door where that gentleman is, go down and hug and kiss one. That's what these guys were making sure you didn't do. Kid, and this was, bombs. no kidding, super serious, guns are loaded, don't screw around. This was uh, the best of the Marines. There's about 50 Marines on board, and these half a dozen guys were the cream of the crop. And that basically life and death job was to protect the nukes with their lives. So they would, if they saw somebody they knew coming through, we knew that he worked up here, no problem, take hey, on. And all of a sudden, here comes some guy with a camera, and uh, they've never seen him before. They want to know who he is, what he's doing here, who sent you, and all that sort of stuff. And you better have the right answers. Otherwise, right around the corner here is the jail, down one level. We'll take a quick look down there if you want. But that's where you're going to end up for a couple of days until they decide why you were here. Because they're going to ask who sent you, and if you say uh, Chief Smith, and they call Chief Smith, and he says, I don't know where that idiot is. Yeah, he left three or four hours ago. We haven't seen him. Big trouble. Big, big trouble. This is not a wink and a nod. This is serious stuff. Now let's, uh, well, once, just before we go down to the break, how do you know where you are on this ship? This is a big ship. 900 feet long, 17 floors or stories or levels to the base of the mast. This, you know, 3,200 people. This is a big ship. The ship is divided into three parts, front, middle, and back, A, B, and C. So we're in the front third of the ship. We're on the third deck. The 21 is an odd number, so that means we're on the starboard side. If it were an even number, we'd be on the port side. But more importantly, we're between frames 67 and 79. This is a frame. And there's one of these, even though it's missing in a lot of places. The way the ship is built, every four feet, there's a frame. At the very front of the ship, frame number one. The very back of the ship, frame number 200 and whatever it is. So between 67 and 79, that's 12 frames. This is 67. That last door we came through back there was 79. So 12 frames, four feet, 48 feet. And anybody you tell or is looking for you, you know literally exactly on the ship where you are. And these signposts are everywhere. So, okay. The brig is too small for everybody to go down at once, so if you don't mind, let's just take half a dozen of you or so and take a look, come out, and the other half come on down, all right? No. 